know, it's always uh, an amazing thing to see how God orchestrates stuff. Um, you know, you're, uh, you you get an idea of how something's going to go, and uh, and you know God's going to be in it, but uh, it always goes uh, better than what you think, you know. And, and I don't mean that just from our, our guest uh, speaker uh, at Sunday school with, with Noah. Let me find out where I can put that, where Noah share, has shared with us. But I'm just thinking about even how they're changing our music this morning and, uh, and how, how full my heart feels right now. It really feels, it really feels full, you know. And, it, and oftentimes I don't, uh, I don't know how to put it, but, uh, you know, I, I love doing what I do. And I, and I love that God's called me to minister, but I, I love it when uh, when uh, my heart gets touched in a way that in my daycare way I do in my life and Christianity and all the stuff I struggle with. I, I, I just love being um, just being pushed out of my comfort zone a little bit. Maybe that's the best way to put it. And our message today is Acts 13, which is really uh, appropriate, I think, for the for the moment. You know, it's the start of something big. You know, as I've shared with you before, I I like to have titles on sermons, and Lisa will say, uh, "Why does a sermon need a title?" I say, "I don't know. It just I guess it looks better when you print it out <laughs> or something." But you know, I, I think we've got the we've got a little glimpse or a vision of, of the star of something big uh, this morning, and we've learned that God is working uh, around the world. Not that we didn't know that already, but we've been reminded that God is working in places like Kosovo. He's working with uh, with uh, a, a young fella and some friends that can go to Pakistan and, and raise funds. Uh, to free people, uh, Christian people enslaved uh, for generations, really, to working in a brick-making factory. And, you know, you don't hear things like that on, on mainstream news, whether, no matter what news you get. Uh, the start of something big, you know. Um, Noah's... And many others are, are at the start of something big. Some of us are maybe in the middle of something big. You may not think it's big, but whatever God is doing in your life, beloved, is big. Amen? Amen. Because God doesn't do little stuff. I think everything God does is big stuff. I, I think if, if, if we diminish it, if, if it's diminished in some way, it's because of our lack of vision and, and our lack of faith. And the early church, the early church where we're at in Acts 13 is the start of something big. I mean, it's, it's already been started for a few years, obviously, because we're in Acts 13, right? We're not in Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> but there's, there were chaotic times in the early church with wars and rumors of war and political upheaval and famine and opposition to, to sharing the truth. And, and as we've heard this morning uh, from our... Brother Noah, is, is things haven't changed that much, have they? <laughs> and the area in Jerusalem and Judea was under duress. Uh, there was a question that came up uh, a week or so ago about these famines and these offerings. Uh, and, you know, during this time of Acts uh, 11, 12, 13, famine was a, uh, a common thing in, in the land of Israel and, and in, the, in, in the Mediterranean world. Some areas would have plenty, some areas would have little. Some of it was, uh, you know, drought related. Some of it, like today, was politically related. You know, Herod would control the food supplies to certain areas to control people. And that still occurs today, obviously, around the world. Um, but there was a... Uh, a real need in Jerusalem, at, at, and uh, and the, the church in Antioch, which is becoming the the, the focal point of, of the early church, uh, met that need. The ministry of helps has always been a hallmark 
of real faith. And, and that, I'm reading that off my notes and these thoughts that have generated. And, and what we've heard this morning, the ministry of helps is a, is a hallmark of, of real faith. And, and uh, Saul and Barnabas we're going to look at. They, they weren't at the forefront of church leadership at the beginning of Acts 13, but things are changing because things always are changing, right? Status, status quo doesn't ever last more than a, uh, a, a moment. Things are always changing. And Saul and Barnabas are able to fulfill their work in Jerusalem, and they gain a recruit by, by, by their gift of helps. They, uh, at the last verse of chapter 12, uh, it says, when they left Jerusalem, they had fulfilled their ministry there. Think about that. They're delivering finances to help uh, people who are suffering with famine and uh, Peter's in prison and things are happening, right? And Herod's dying over in Caesarea. And, uh, but they took with them John, whose surname was Mark. John Mark, uh, who became a, 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 a real uh, uh, helper to Peter and wrote the book of Mark, okay? In Acts 12, 25, it said, When they had fulfilled their ministry... And when I read that a couple weeks ago, and even as this, this message is coming to go, when they fulfilled their ministry, and, and I'm thinking about John Mark, and, and you're already jumping ahead to thinking like, yeah, he's a guy that, that bailed on him, and, uh, but he comes back, okay? But uh, I've, I've heard many uh, preachers over the years say it's always too early to quit. And, and, and so I want you to get that thought in your mind today. It's always too early to quit in your walk with the Lord. So let's pray once again. Father, we just thank you for the chance to look into your word. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is going to reveal some things to each of us uh, as we go through this message. Father, I thank you that you're going to change some of my thoughts as we go through this message. But Father, whatever comes out, I just pray, will honor and glorify you, will exalt the name and person and ministry and life of Jesus, and that would be uh, uh, useful to the Holy Spirit to, uh, to uh, illuminate your word and to uh, convict us of sin and to cast a, uh, maybe a new vision uh, in our lives, Father. And as always, Father, if I must speak or misrepresent you, please strike that from the people's memories before we leave today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Acts 13 verses 1 through 3 <coughs> it says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, Tetrarch and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work unto which I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Spirit, departed unto Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John as their helper. And when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all deceit, all mischief, thou child of the devil, Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And then immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. <coughs> then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now when Paul and his com company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, Return to Jerusalem. <clears throat> the work in Antioch, when we read this first verse here of this chapter, 
helps us understand that this work did not start by a visit from one of the twelve, one of the twelve apostles from the Jerusalem church. It was a large, economically powerful city. It was a militarily important city. And it was a large city. A lot of people were there. And it was close to the sea, but it was not a seaport. It was a few miles inland. <coughs> and Christians, and probably most of them, or many of them, saved at, at Pentecost, at Peter's sermon in Acts 2. Um, and subsequent years had, had come to Antioch, and a body of faith had grown. And... and as you read through the book of Acts, I don't know about you, but when it was, a lot of times when I read Acts, I'm thinking rural ministry, rural ministry. But in many respects, it was an urban city ministry in the book of Acts. Because most of what we read occurs in cities. Not that a lot of stuff didn't happen along the way, but, but even here in, in, in a couple chapters in Acts, there are six major cities mentioned, you know. We don't hear about a lot of... Uh, Hey, they stopped by the side of the road, built a little fire, and found a caravan of slave traders and ministered to them. Now, I'm sure that happened, obviously, right? But what we have recorded for us is an urban city ministry. There's 40-plus cities and towns named in the book of Acts. You know, it depends how you split some of the hairs, Okay. And in 13 and 14, I believe six cities are named. And we got some interesting people here, right? Barnabas. We've heard of Barnabas, right? Cyprus. He's from Cyprus. He's a rich guy, probably. Sold some land, gave it to the apostles. People tried to imitate him. Ananias and Sapphira didn't work out so well, right? They were trying to, to run a little uh, scam. And they could scam the people, but not the Holy Spirit. But we got Barnabas. We got Simeon, who was called Niger. And uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Why he got two names, right? What that might represent. Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean. Interesting little footnote here. He had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. We have quite a cosmopolitan, uh, <coughs> multicultural group leading this church in Antioch. Okay? And I think what we, what we see here is these guys were serving. They had proven themselves to be servants, and, and they were recognized. The Holy Spirit recognizes them because the Holy Spirit has called them as prophets and, and teachers. And it says, and they did what? In verse 2, they ministered unto the Lord. That ministered has more of a... Of a you know, we think a minister, we think like, well, maybe they're working, they're doing something with their hands, and that's probably true, doing something with their minds. But, but it really has to, that word minister too has to do with the priestly service. It's like it was more than just work. It was their attitude. It was their posture. It was their, um, these were godly men, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And godly leaders were, were appointed to preach, teach, and lead. And God used this group. And I want us to take a moment here, and, and as you all know, I'm no Greek scholar, but <coughs> this word prophet is prophetes, and, and it's a noun word, and, and it's a masculine word. It's a, and, and it's a, in the Christian arena, it's one who's moved by the Spirit of God as, as God's spokesman. Because think about it, right now, the New Testament is not written. So where are they going to get their truth? They have the Old Testament scripture, but where are they going to get you know New Testament church doctrine, church knowledge, and a church understanding? They're going to get it from the Holy Spirit, and they're going to receive it by inspiration. Um, Old Testament prophets often dealt with foretelling the future. New Testament prophets are foretelling truth. Not that they don't do a little of the other, like Agabus, you know, talks about famines. We looked at that last week, right? John the Baptist, he was a New Testament prophet. He was a truth teller. Jesus, obviously, right? He fulfilled both roles. He not only could predict the future perfectly, he was, he was. because it's in his hands, right? But he could, he, he spoke truth. 
And these prophets were often associated with the apostles, and they discern what is best for the church. You know, in Acts 11, we looked about, we read about that. Teachers, uh, or uh, the dasketos, again, a noun masculine word, a teacher, teaching the things of God, teaching the duties of man, helping understand, helping explain and understand what the prophets would have said, okay? Uh, John the Baptist was a teacher. Jesus was a teacher. Paul is a teacher. Peter is a teacher. Okay? Here we, we, we read Barnabas, Simeon, and we, we got these guys' names. Uh, they undertook the work of teaching with the special assistance of the Holy Spirit. And they ministered to, okay? They ministered to the Lord. That word minister, the word liturgy comes from the same word. Lit litor eo. And I know I butchered that one good. But they, they serve at their own cost, has, is implied in that. They serve at their own cost. Noah, you and your friends are ministering to the people in Kosovo, Israel, and Pakistan because you ministered to, at your own cost, right? In a sense. It was a, it was a spiritual act of worship. It was, a, it, was, it was a physical act of worship. But when it said they ministered, they discharged. It could go to, with a public official, discharging, discharging their public official duties at their own expense. But in, in the church here, they're doing a service, performing a work. A priest and Levites, it was used who busied themselves with the sacred rites in the tabernacle or temple. And that same thought passes over into the church. Of Christians serving Christ, whether by prayer or instructing others along the way, that's ministering to the Lord. It's, uh, it's helping people find salvation. And it can involve physical things. It can involve monetary assistance. It can just be a ministry of presence. They were doing a lot of stuff is what I'm trying to say. Amen? Amen. Honoring God, lifting up Christ, trying to help people learn and grow in their faith. And their service led to them being selection and recognized, okay? And we read that because they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit taking the people who are doing what they're called to do, recognizing that, the people recognize it, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work which I have called them. Now, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit spoke in an audible voice, but, you know, I think about my own personal experience. There were a lot of, God was speaking to a lot of people, to Dave and Lisa, saying, you guys should get out of the Forest Service and go into ministry for 10 years. They would say because we, they saw that we were, I guess, gifted for that. They saw something that we didn't see. They thought, you could do this, okay? And as I've told you before, I thought, that's just uh, absolutely crazy. But that was God speaking through people. And one day, the spirit of Dave Carroll finally listened to the spirit of God, and I, and I answered him audibly. I didn't hear an audible voice, but I sat up in bed, and I think I've told you this before, at 3 in the morning, I says, I'll do it. It makes no sense to me. <laughs> <clears throat> that was probably about 1993, but it was still eight years before I got out here full time, right? Because it still took some time. But the Holy Spirit said, celebrate these guys, because I've called them to this work. You recognize that they're gifted to do this work. Separate them out. Let them go. Let them go. Because these guys were prophets. They were men in whom the Spirit had given message, message along with the apostles. And, and, and they were working. They were a foundation of the church, like Ephesians 2.20 tells us. You know, the apostles <coughs> and, and, and these folks working now are the foundation of the church. But Christ is the cornerstone, okay? It all starts with Christ. You know, 2 Timothy 2.2 2, uh, Paul told Timothy to commit the truth to faithful men worthy of the investment who would then teach others. So this idea of having teachers continues on to this day, right? We need teachers. 
We need people to help us understand. And we have more available to us than anybody in our world. But you got to make sure they're a good teacher and biblical teachers. Simeon, whose name was Niger, was most likely an African believer. Black. Niger it means black. Lucia Sumfield may have been one of the founders of the work of Antioch there. I've, I've, I've read a couple commentaries that suggest that. I don't know where they got that from. I'm sure if I studied more, I'd figure it out. The name was either a foster brother or an adopted brother of Herod Antipas who had beheaded John the Baptist. Interesting. A foster brother or half-brother of the guy who killed John the Baptist, he's a leader in the church of Antioch. God has a great sense of humor. He's got a great plan, and he'll use anyone, right? Just think of the division that was in that family. Or a potential division, you know. One guy's killing John the Baptist, the, the Messianic forerunner. The other guy, he's helping start, you know, the, 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 the new churches. I think we learned from this is a few verses here, though. And we learned from what we heard this morning. If you want God to use you, you know what you got to do? Let him. Huh? Let him. let him. But what do you got to do to let God use you? You got to get busy. <laughs> a couple weeks ago, remember I told you you got to get out of the boat, right? Yeah. You know, you got to get busy. You know, sometimes I wonder if 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 if, uh, if God doesn't look around and and think, man, I got a bunch of loafers. <laughs> and I got to admit, as I was putting this together, you all know I probably like Outlaw Josie Wales, one of my favorite movies. You know, when they finally got to the place in Texas. And they were, Granny was sleeping out this musty old cabin. Josie Wales walked in, and, and uh, he was ready just to kind of relax. And, and uh, the, the old Granny, she, said, she, she was sweeping like crazy, stirring up dust. And Josie's about ready to spit some snooze on the floor, right, because he chewed tobacco. And uh, she looked up at him and gave him that look. And, and uh, she's like, we've got to get busy. We've got to make this place good. She goes, I never took you for a loafer. <laughs> and he turned around and walked out. Some of you might have know, know what I'm talking about. If you, got, if you want God to use you, you got to get busy. Don't have God look at you and think, there's a real loafer. But God's going to call someone, and God does call people, as we see here, and those around the call one are going to confirm or affirm the call as they see the sincerity and results of the work the called one is doing. You know, I've seen a lot of people who are called to do a lot of different things for God, and within a very short period of time, they're not doing that work, because you know why? They weren't called. I've seen a lot of people called to come to Montana to do ministry, and they were called to come trout fish, and they were fly fish, and they were called to come chase elk. But they weren't called to go do a Bible club with one kid when it's 30 below zero out. You know? But God will see what you're doing, and, and if you want God to use you, you probably you gotta get busy. If someone if someone says they're called to do a, a certain job, especially a ministry for the Lord, and they haven't done anything to prove up yet, I did, I haven't even told people, I said, I don't think you're called at all. I said, I just think you want to do it because you think it's an easy job. That doesn't always go over well, but it makes for some fun conversations, okay? <laughs> but I've seen the damage that has occurred for the cause of Christ when people show up and they don't get things done in the right way. And they minister to the Lord. And I talked about that service. Service. All of our ministry is an act of worship. All of life is an act of worship, okay? Life is not secular and life is not sacred for Christians. Beloved, if you're a Christian, everything is sacred because God's with you 100% of the time, right? Amen. And God is, God, God it never goes off the clock and we shouldn't either. And that doesn't mean we got to be working ourselves to the bone because there's rest principles, etc. But, you know, we got to remember that we are obligated, we are committed, we are going to be held accountable to how we live for God. It goes back to worldview. It goes back to how we make decisions. It goes back to how we use our time. It goes back to how we use our finances. 
It goes back to how we use our gifts, talents, and abilities, natural and spirit-given. But God wants to use us to start something big and to continue something big. And the Antioch church, I think, as you read through in the scriptures and even further in Acts, they'll come back around. They had prayer, they had praise, and they had performance clicking <clears throat> on all cylinders. In our Western way of looking at things, sometimes we're way too compartmentalized in how we do things. And I'll be the first one to raise my hand to that, right? <coughs> in selection, we see a selection here. Godly leaders are appointed to preach, teach, and lead, and God selects. The Spirit said, God speaks without words through His Spirit. You want to, uh, about the, one of the best verses I know, sections of Scripture to, to support that, go to, go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I know I've taken this here for other things in the past, but it just seems to be one of them sections of Scripture that God uses in a variety of ways. God, God can speak without words to His Spirit. You know, when you read the Bible, when an angel has a message to communicate, what's the angel do? Does he speak? The angel said, right? <coughs> well, thank you. When Yahweh speaks in the Old Testament, what's he do? He speaks. He talks. When Jesus speaks, he speaks. I think when the Holy Spirit speaks, he speaks through the Word of God. He thinks, speaks through our spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9-13. through 13. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. God speaks through our spirit, beloved, that's how God communicates with us internally. It's a spiritual thing. And after he gets done communicating with us spiritually, he, he, I think our spirit can then affect our mind, our will, our emotions, right? But the spirit, it's a, it's a metaphysical thing. It's a faith thing. The word of God, prayer, memorization, worship, sharing. It's that still small voice. And when the Spirit of God speaks to you, He will never speak in opposition to the revealed written Word of God. I have talked to so many people, they say God spoke to them and God said this and God said that, but it's in opposition to this. We see here in Acts 13, verses 4 and 5, selection leads to sending. Before you can send someone, you've got to select them, right? So they being sent forth by the Holy Spirit departed unto Seleucia. And it took me a little digging, but a couple miles west of Antioch, there was an old town called Seleucia. We had a harbor at that point in time, and that harbor is all silted in. But they went down there to the coast, and they departed from there. They sailed to Cyprus. Do you remember where Barnabas was from? Cyprus. Barnabas is going home. You know? That's a good thing to do. If you're going to be a minister for the gospel, sometimes that's not such a good thing to do, right? Well, it's always a good thing to do, but it's not always an easy thing to do. That's probably a more factually accurate statement. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. <coughs> Selection leads to sending. The Lord called and qualified and sent them off. The church let them go. Beloved, when somebody in your family wants to go do some ministry, you got to let them go. When someone in the church wants to do some ministry, you got to let them go. Because if we don't let them go, they can't go. They can't minister and fulfill their calling. Right? Many are called many call of God have been hindered by friends, family, or their home church from fulfilling their call. They've been told, "You're not qualified. You can't do this. This will never work." 
If God want, you know, William Carey even was told, if God wants to save the, the heathen in Africa, he can do it without you. And we call him, what, the father of modern missions in a sense? Sent by the Spirit, by the hand of God, filled by the Spirit, controlled by God. That's what a real Christian missionary has to do. And that's what you have to do, beloved, each day you step out your door. Because each day you go, you're a Christian. Each day you leave home, you're a Christian missionary. Okay? You may not have it on a name tag, but it's written down up in heaven. Right? Yeah, what a crew. Pharisee, Saul, Hellenistic, Greek culture, Barnabas from Cyprus, and we got homeboy John Mark. God can use a diverse group of people, right? That harbor, I said it was silted in. You know, back in the day, the Romans, and, and, and back in the time of Solomon building the temple, a lot of the logs probably came from this part of the world. And when they logged it, they didn't have feller bunchers and forwarders. What'd they do? Horses? You know, people always say this This has nothing to do with the sermon necessarily, but horse logging leads to a lot of ground lead skidding, which leads to a lot of uh, um, sedimentation and erosion. <clears throat> sometimes the things, you know, the spiritual application is sometimes things we think look good and are good lead to a lot of erosion. Make sure you're screening things by the Word of God and what God has you to do. Because we've all done a lot of good things in our life that have eroded our faith, have eroded our testimony. Because we thought, oh, it looks good. We were pragmatic and not spirit-led. So, we got these guys selected, we got guys sent, right? What do you think the next S is going to be? I am actually have an a alliteration going today, which is unusual for me. <laughs> Starting in verse 6 to 11, sending leads to sabotage. Has anyone ever tried to sabotage something you were trying to do for Christ? A lot. It happens mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. It happens on a big scale. Mm -hmm. happens on a little scale. And it happens sometimes when you don't expect it. And sometimes it happens when you do expect it, right? But in verses 6 to 11, quite interesting section of scripture. <coughs> it says, they had gone through the island of Paphos. They found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. A false prophet, a Jew, who had turned his back on his covenant God, on his people. Okay? Not good. And he, but but he, was, he, he had plans, he had goals, he had desires, because who's he hanging with? Sergius Paulus. The deputy of the country, a politically important person, a leader. But it was also was a prudent man. Okay? A prudent, he had intelligence, he had good sense, but you know, somehow he was blinded. Maybe it was some satanic blindness why he had this, this false prophet, this Bar Jesus, this Elemus hanging out with him, this sorcerer. But as a tool of, of Satan, this guy was crafty, right? You know, Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians, I believe, that even uh, uh, Satan can uh, disguise himself and his, his uh, demons as angels of light, right? That's what they do. But these guys got over there, Sergius Paulus, a man, he desired to hear the word of God. Obviously, God was working on this guy's heart. God was calling him. He... He had been exposed to some truth. But the devil saw he was moving towards truth and he was trying to bring a curtain of darkness. Keep that curtain of darkness there. Well, we see Saul in verse 9 and here's an interesting thing. What's it say? Saul and Luke interposes this who is also called Paul. Filled, controlled by the Holy Spirit, set his eyes on him. Saul gets a new name here, and he gets a new role. He is moving to leadership. He is moving to the forefront of this story. And the opposition takes on a new form. Saul gets a new name. He's, he's working on a new position. 
The opposition takes on a new form. Bar Jesus, son of Jesus. Maybe he was trying to capitalize on, on the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. And so we thought, hey, if my name sounds like the real deal, maybe I can make a little extra cash. Maybe I can get a little bigger following. Okay? But I call him a reprobate Jew. He was an occult dabbler, a magi of sorts. He was probably raised and exposed to the truth, yet he's serving Satan. He's a traitor to God and his people. He's a sorcerer. He's living for devilish and worldly things. And like I said, Sergius Paulus, a political man, prudent, intelligent, good sense. You know, the devil will attack. Anyone who desires to, to draw close to God, the devil is going to be attacking that person. And even once you get saved and you get into the kingdom of God, the devil's still going to attack you. He can't steal your soul, but he can sure steal your testimony and your effectiveness, right? And keep you from fulfilling the ministry you, you're supposed to do. But Sergius Paulus wanted to hear and learn. He desired to hear. He desired to hear. He, he, he really wanted to hear. He, he had an earnest desire to hear. And it's like he was passionate about it. You know, sometimes people say they want to hear about God, but you can tell they don't, right? They're trying to placate yeah. you. But when somebody really desires to hear, they're like a sponge waiting to soak it up. Epizeteo. He inquired, he was seeking, he was searching, he was seeking diligently. It was like a wish, like a craving, you know. It's like 11.30 at night when the vanilla ice cream and the peanut butter <laughs> are just screaming. They crave, they desire my company. <laughs> I don't want them, but they want me. <laughs> I think his desire for the word of God was even better and bigger than that. He desired to hear. That, that here is, 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 is like, he really wanted to understand and perceive what this, what this word was about, what this Christianity was about, what this Jesus thing was about. He wanted to give ear to a real teaching. He wanted comprehension. He wanted understanding. He wanted to fully turn to the Lord. And Elemas is actively hostile, withstanding the truth. Not just a little bit in opposition, but he's active. He's taking concrete steps. It's, it's like his strategy to keep a man ready to be saved from being saved. He's trying to turn, turn from the right path. He was trying to sabotage, okay, the work of these sending agents. But don't you love Saul, who is now called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, he said, O full of all deceit and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? That is not friendship evangelism, is it? No. You know, sometimes we need to, to, to be understanding and, and be gracious, you know, because we're not talking here about someone who's, who's just... You know, kind of a normal sinner. I mean, if I can use such a, a classification. But, you know, some people don't know they, they need the Lord. Some people just don't understand, you know, and, and they're stumbling along because they really don't know. This guy knew, and he was actively in opposition to the truth, to the word, to the gospel. And those people need to get strong medicine. Right? Because they are an active agent of evil. Out. They're trying to turn people from the from the right way. A systematic effort to pervert and hide truth desires or yeah deserves a harsh rebuke. And I know some people may not like it, and and sometimes in dealing with with some of our major cults today, I've used a gentle approach with people. And sometimes and and sometimes I've used a harsh rebuke. And that has to do with Mormons, Jehovah Witness, uh, Muslims, Eastern cultic systems, you know, Wiccans, Satan worshipers. Yeah. And, and dealing with people of those type of uh, religious systems, 
I've been friends with people. And I've been co-workers. And I've had gentle conversations and good dialogue. But sometimes I've had some very tough words. And it just depends on the circumstances. And God will show you and reveal to you when you need to be one way or another. Paul here, totally under control of the Spirit. His life, both public and private, was in harmony and pleasing with God. <clears throat> and he's taken charge. And he's bold for Christ. And you know he's bold for Christ because his love for Sergius Paulus is great, you know. He, he, through the Spirit, I believe Paul knew this man was close. And he was not going to let the devil steal this man's rightful joy place and moment to believe. And he said, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you'll be blind not seeing the sun for a season. Strong medicine. Strong medicine. Spiritual blindness led to physical blindness. That happens to us all. Sin always takes us where we don't want to go, doesn't it? Sin will always take you where you don't want to go. But we also see grace in this rebuke. Do you see it? Do you see it? He says, he went away seeking someone to help him. He was blind. He was not seeing the sun. It said for a season, for a time. We don't know what happened to this guy. But there's a hint of grace in there. You know, God's always got some grace for people. And strong medicine leads to salvation. The deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. You know, if you've got an infection, what do you want to get? Antibiotics? Yep. If you've got an old rusty car body that's a classic you want to restore, what do you want to do to get the rust off of that car body? They don't do it so much around here. Back where I grew up, though, there were places acid bath. You'd take your body panels off your car and then dip them in acid. And it would clean the rust off. And then you'd get a nice clean shiny piece of sheet metal to paint before the humidity got to it and it started rusting again. If you have cancer, what often are, is, works to kill the cancer? Radiation? Chemotherapy? That's harsh stuff, isn't it? It's terrible. Sometimes it's worse than the, the disease. The miracle of, of blindness revealed the false hope this magician brought. Because this miracle of blindness revealed that what he had to say wasn't true. What he had to say was false hope. It validated the word. It validated the ministry of Paul. It validated... The forgiveness and salvation that Christ has. The Holy Spirit did something strong because there was strong opposition. Sin and death can only be defeated by the blood of Christ. You know, we needed salvation. We needed strong medicine. And God gave us the cross. He was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. People today often are astonished at the doctrine of the Lord, but in a negative sense. It's like, can you believe that stuff? You really believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? You need a Savior? Really? I thought you were smarter than that. People will tell you things like that. You believe that God created the world in six days and that man is really made in God's image? And I just said, do you really believe that that rock can produce life? Right. Do. Depends where you're going to put your faith. Yeah. Yeah. Closing thoughts in this section, chapter 13, we have new opposition, but we have a new manifestation of God's power, the Spirit's power, in blinding this man for a season. So far in Acts, we've seen a lot of stuff. We've seen the anti-supernatural Sadducees rebuked early on, right? We've seen political powers and authorities rebuffed and confused at various times, either through spoken words or empty jail cells, right? We've seen angels working miracles. We've seen the Word of God working miracles. Now we see the Spirit working miracles. 
as we're, we're, where we're at about halfway through this book, we see that the Great Commission has taken shape. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? Go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Now, now they're starting to dabble into the uttermost parts of the world, I mean, in a sense. We see false supernaturalism and the occult joining the attack. And that continues today, big time. Okay? The world's philosophies are always taking people away from God. And they are growing today in so many ways. And boy, our technology is an open invitation to, to, to mental and spiritual pollution. I don't have to tell you anything about that. I mean, we all know that. We see it in our culture and how people think and how they react. But you know, one thing I love about what we just read here this morning, this, uh, this is a salvation story. This, this is the old, old story, right? I think I want us to go away thinking about this. It's what we learn here. It's Jesus or it's nothing. It's Jesus or perdition. It's either Jesus or Satan. There's no other choice. There's light and darkness. What's it going to be? My hope and prayer is that all of us here today are, are walking in the light, but we may not be. If Christ is not your Savior, if you haven't truly received Him as Savior, today is the day to do it. Today is the day of salvation. If Jesus is your Savior, beloved, then... We need to think of, we're part of something big and fulfill our role. Let's not be afraid to, to get out of the boat. I'll go back to that. Let's step out of the boat. Let's walk through the prison gate that's open. Let's get our visa, our passport stamped and go somewhere where you've never been before. Serve coffee, make bricks, right? We can get out of our comfort zone. We can do that. Amen? Amen. We learn here that Paul, from Paul that to offend someone by telling them they're wrong about the Lord Jesus may be the greatest act of love we can show or give them. I'll say that again. To offend someone by telling them they are wrong about the Lord Jesus may be the greatest act of love we can show or give to them. Oh. We'll, we'll close it off right there. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for the work you're doing in this great big world, most of which we do not see. We thank you for the work you're doing in each of our hearts individually. Father, help us to, uh, to desire you more than silver or gold, uh, more than precious stones or silver. Father, I thank you for the time we've had this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right.